This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. You open your eyes, and the harsh white light blinds you, almost as if your eyes had been closed for a long time. In front of you stand two kids with their Pokemon. They must be about your age. They stand there, cautious. After all, they came out here to investigate some kind of blinding light, bigger than anything their village had ever seen. To their relief, you're not from the Fire Nation, or so it seems. All you can really remember is your name plus the fact that you came crashing down here, and now you're lost. The two kids offer to help you. They offer to bring you to their village, since they can sense that you need help, even if their village is wary of outsiders these days. To be clear, though I'm telling a story that mirrors the events of the original series, now with Pokemon, I am fully aiming for this to be a game concept first and foremost, with plenty of my original artwork of Fakemon, just like any other video that I would do here on the channel. The Last Airbender is easily one of my favorite shows of all time, and I would be crazy to try to retell this story any better, story-wise or visually. So unlike my Pokemon Z series, this will be very light on exact story moments, much less dialogue. You can assume that character interactions, character arcs, and minor story beats occur just as they do in the original series. So sit back and enjoy that focus of the video. However, before we go any further, now seems as good a time as any to mention today's sponsor, Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. These are a pair of Japanese snack food subscription boxes with tons to offer in each one. Tokyo Treat is a neat box boasting modern flair, like this month's collection of snacks from the Akibahara district, a hub of entertainment and culture in Tokyo. These treats are bright and colorful, like this chestnut Kit Kat, which I think I might like even better than regular Kit Kats and this mystery Fanta, which tastes really good. Can you figure out what flavor it is? In contrast, the Sakura Ko box is chock full of more traditional goodies straight from the autumn season over in Japan, in a tradition known as Koyo. What better way to immerse in the fall scenery than to enjoy these delicious maple leaf shaped cookies, or this more savory rice cracker mix? Both were really good when paired with this Genmai tea. And of course, each Sakura Ko box comes with a piece of tableware for you. This month, sporting an adorable autumn coloration. You all know how much I enjoy this season, and if you do too, head over to the link in my description where you can use my code to get $5 off your first box of your choosing. A big thank you to Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co for sponsoring the channel and making videos like this possible. So after a short walk through this icy tundra, you arrive at Lycanroc Cove, a cozy village on the northern coast of the Southern Water Tribe. The population numbers have dwindled after years of raids from the Fire Nation, so your arrival might be a sign of hope. After all, all the airbenders should be extinct by now, save for the Avatar. So you try to explain that you are the Avatar, but they won't believe you quite yet. If you are, you need to prove it, otherwise you'll be banned from the village for good. The elders explain that there's an area just north of the town known as the Wreckage, a scrapyard of abandoned Fire Nation raid vessels. Since all the warriors are now gone, the elders of the town fear the vessels are being used as bases, but no one from the village has dared to investigate. So you're tasked with heading over there and fighting off any remaining firebenders to keep the village safe. In return, you're offered the accompaniment of one of these three Pokemon that now live in the village. You have a choice between Chespin, the spiny nut Pokemon recovered from the eastern canyons of the Earth Kingdom, Litten, the fire cat Pokemon, a stowaway vermin catcher from one of those abandoned Fire Nation vessels, and Mudkip, a gift from the ally swamp bending tribe deep in the southern Earth Kingdom. Once you make your choice, you are tasked with heading west of Lycanroc Cove to the wreckage, an ice bank full of several abandoned, rusted ships. 
the metal creaks in the tide as you explore the ships inside, where you eventually find one pair of firebenders who you're tasked with fighting off. Here's the full list of Pokemon that firebenders would use at this point in your journey, meaning most of Book 1. Once you beat them and they escape, they trigger a flare signal that, unbeknownst to you, grabs the attention of a certain someone. You return to the village, explaining what you accomplished, and in return, the elders accept you, letting you keep the Pokemon that you chose. If you really are the Avatar, they say, it's your duty to travel the world and learn all the elements through trial. After all, bending is derived from Pokemon, Every Pokemon that you form a bond with will boost your bending just a little bit. However, several corners of the world have strong Pokemon that they worship as noble Pokemon. Traditionally, the Avatar has gone to the corners of the world during their training and learned from these nobles, getting their blessings from them to boost different aspects of their bending. However, in the time of the Avatar's absence and for some unexplained reason, Pokemon have seemed more hostile than usual. No one has seen the noble of the Southern Water Tribe for over 50 years, and many of the Pokemon on this island have assumed fearsome forms that they call Alpha Forms. So it's your job to investigate what's going on with the noble here, and maybe, along the way, you'll be able to get some waterbending experience in return. Now it's time for you to explore the Southern Water Tribe in an open world format, a vast expanse of open land on your way to the noble's lair. You can do this on foot or in the back of your flying Altaria, your first ride Pokemon known as a Guardian. There are several to be found in this world, and you automatically have the first one by virtue of being an airbender, as this one was frozen in the ice with you and can be called upon at will. These Guardian Pokemon were all once worshipped by their respective nations in more spiritual times, and in some cases it's thought that bending styles were learned from these Pokemon, such as the case with Altaria and airbending. With rudimentary Pokeballs in hand, you can now catch as many Pokemon as you would like, and add them to your team as you explore the island. You're first in Lycanroc Cove, the village and its outskirts that you're now familiar with. Roaming around the watchtowers, igloos, and fields are friendly Cubchoo, Eevee, and this unique variant of Rockruff. Rockruff, the husky Pokemon, a pure ice type. Born in the harshest of winter tundras, these Pokemon are naturally wary from birth. They only form bonds with trainers who possess the bravest and the wisest of hearts. They grow chilled ice crystals on their thick scruffs, which they can use to ward off foes in combat if necessary. To the east of the cove, on the northern shore of the island, is Crystal Harbor, a pristine bay of calm Antarctic water where you can catch Piplup, Magikarp, Feebas, and Remoraid. There's also an Alpha Prinplup that you can challenge. To the north, off the peninsula, is Bergmite Strait, a series of icebergs that float off the coast and are used for ritual ice dodging by waterbending tribe warriors when they come of age. Here you can catch Sveal, Aracuda, Bergmites, and Shelder. There's also an Alpha Celio for you to challenge. Keep in mind you can only go so far out into the straits by walking on stable icebergs or flying on the back of Altaria close to the ground. You can't yet swim, but you will be able to in time. As you head south around the eastern coast, there's another settlement known as the Eastern Glacier Outpost. Here you can heal up by the fire, trade with the scouts who rest here, or buy and sell items, such as rare berries that grow in the tundra. Around the tents and the fortresses, you can find wild centret, clobopus, snover, and sandshrew. Back towards the village, there's the wreckage, where you once fought those firebenders. You can catch plenty of Pokemon inside the ships and out of them, many of them being stowaways from the Fire Nation such as Elekid, Cubone, Magby, Meowth, or you can find Basculin or Quillfish in the waters around the abandoned ships. In the captain's quarters of one ship, there's an Alpha Delmise for you to fight if you'd like. Finally, at the center of the island is a vast, empty expanse known as the Everstorm Tundra, where there's a year-round flurry of snow and ice, and the southern lights at nighttime. It's beautiful, but dangerous. You can find Duskull, Zura, Ghastly, more Rockruff, and Snowrunt, haunting the area, plus an Alpha Haunter. Oh yeah, and there would also be an Ice Rock to evolve your Eevee into a Glaceon, with random water stones found throughout the area, and of course the option to evolve it into an Umbreon, Espeon, or Sylveon regardless of location. So that's five possible evolutions in the first major area. As tough as this area may be, you must push forward, because at the center of the Everstorm Tundra lies one mountain with a cave inside of it.
the Everstorm Cavern. You venture into the crystalline cavern, hearing the strange howling of a beast. By this time, you should have a small but strong team ready for the challenge ahead. You expect to find the noble Pokemon welcoming you, but... This noble Lycanroc is enraged, glowing a bright golden hue and twice its normal size. You need to calm it down by fighting it with bombs that you've crafted, calming it before you can engage with it in battle. It takes time, and it's a hard-fought battle fending off its bites and its icy attacks. But once you beat it, it reverts to its normal form, kneeling before you as it recognizes your purpose. A bright hue emerges, and you feel a new power surge through you. You've now learned basic water bending, meaning you can send water, snow, and ice at your opponents and move small objects made of these materials. You smile, feeling something inside of yourself, as though your past lives are trying to tell you something, but there's no time. A cannon goes off, and the cavern shakes. You go outside, investigating the blast. From the mountain, you can see ships off the coast, heading towards Lycanroc Cove. The Fire Nation has arrived. Now your final test in this area begins. As you return to the village, you must set off into the water and fight off the fleet using your newfound ice and water bending abilities to freeze platforms around you to run on towards the ships. You can attack the whole of the ships yourself using your air bending or water bending abilities, and you can send out your Pokemon to perform auto attacks. But keep in mind the Fire Nation can send blasts of cannons and fireballs to destroy the ice they are standing on and deal minor damage to you and your Pokemon. After you destroy three ships, it's time to climb the ladder of the command ship, where you come face to face with someone about your age the leader of these ships who smirks, as if he's been looking for you for quite some time now. You face off against him in a regular battle, where he uses Hemdower, Cyndaquil, and Charmeleon. Once you beat him, all the ships start to sink and the command ships retreat, so you return on Altaria safely to the village where they all congratulate you. They all believe now that after beating and calming down Lycanroc and stopping this new fleet, you truly must be the Avatar. They give you supplies for your journey, where they tell you to head to the North Pole, home of the Northern Water Tribe, where you can truly learn from the masters of waterbending. Alongside healing items, you get a leather-bound booklet that they call the Pokedex, a catalog of all the Pokemon that you've encountered on your journey. Completing the Pokedex is obviously not an imperative goal of this new Legends game, but it is beneficial to do in the sense that I'm unveiling a new mechanic called the Bending Boost. Since you're the Avatar, you will eventually have to control all four elements, of which every Pokemon type is evenly divided among, minus normal and bug types as the two neutral types that provide no boost. For each Pokemon that you catch under a certain element category and keep in your party, you get a 10% boost to your bending, power, stamina, range, or effect, depending on the action. Each Pokemon's type is counted as well, so having a pure water type in your party will get you a 10% boost, but a water and ice type, well, that's a 20% boost. Of course, you only have intermediate airbending and basic waterbending abilities for now, but it doesn't hurt to keep this mechanic in mind as you build your team and learn the two remaining elements. By the way, let me know what your teams would look like as we progress through this and you meet even more Pokemon. If you would like at the end of this video, drop a comment below to tell me what your team looks like at the conclusion of Book 1. Now it's time for you to set off into the sky on Altaria's back, exploring the vast sea between the Earth Kingdom and the Southern Water Tribe dipping down, jetting forward, or performing loops. You can stop at tiny islands to rest and look for items before you reach your first stop. Your home, the Southern Air Temple. You can investigate the ruins of this temple, now seemingly abandoned. Here you can encounter a Swablu, a Molga, or Alpha Sigilyph somewhere on the plateau. But your purpose is clear. Figure out what happened to the airbenders. You can solve a variety of puzzles to open the chambers to the meditation room. Where the worst fear comes to pass. No one. Proof of the Fire Nation scourge on your people. From this anger, you start to glow. You rise into the air with rage. With confusion. What's happening? As quickly as it began, it ends. You return to the ground. 
Alongside heading to the North Pole, maybe something along the way will explain what state you just entered. You return to your journey, officially entering the Western Earth Kingdom. Hundreds of miles of shoreline that'll lead you straight to the North Pole have followed. First, you find yourself crossing the eastern section of the Mose Sea, a vast expanse where you can encounter Whalmer, Tentacool, Carvana, Finion, and Soaring Wingle. On small rocky islands closer to the shore, you might be able to find a Cramorant or two. There's also this unique variant of Chatot. Chatot, the privateer Pokemon, a dark and flying type. These Chatot are extremely rude and loud Pokemon, capable of extending their grating voices hundreds of yards thanks to their large beaks and vocal cords. As such, they are often companions on pirate vessels throughout the world, known for their petty drive for mischief and penchant for theft. From here, it's really up to you which direction you go. The whole Western Earth Kingdom is ripe for exploration. First up is Kiyoshi Island, a small settlement right off the southern coast where you can catch a variety of Pokemon, including Froakie and Breezel in the ponds and beaches, Magikarp in the harbor, and perhaps a rarer or a Corio, Ladyba or Nuzleaf in the woods of the island. You can meet some new allies who you can battle against to prove your worth, and help them defeat a massive Alpha Gyarados lurking in their bay that they call the Unagi. As a reward, you'll be learning the ins and outs of fan combat, another type of weapon that you now have in your arsenal alongside your air glider. The same way you can interact with overworld enemies and obstacles with your bending, or by your Pokemon autoing, you can also learn various weapon-based skills like this one to do the same thing. Many market stalls that you'll encounter around the world will sell items, so it's worth keeping a few on hand. If you go a bit further north, you can rest in Omashu City, a massive hillside metropolis with tons of trading stalls, secret tunnels to explore, and a trial dojo, operated by your old friend, the King, who will let you practice your air or water bending in a safe environment. You can roam the hillside alleyways to catch a Benelby or Timber, or venture deeper into the King's Crystal Tunnels to get yourself a Roggenrola, Drillbur, or Rare Carbink for your team. As you head further north, the forest gets denser, as you find the Gaipon Outpost, a small village of Earth Kingdom refugees led by an enigmatic freedom fighter. You can explore this treetop village to find Pancham, Trico, Cottony, Stunky, Scyther, Farfetched, and Talo. There would also be a moss rock within the village where you could evolve your Eevee into a sixth option, a Leafeon plus a black augurite item scattered somewhere to get yourself that cleavor. You can head off the coast once again to a Fire Nation prison rig, where you can free some earthbenders from these places that you visited who have been wrongfully taken. This would prompt more battles with those Fire Nation soldier grunts, using combinations of those Pokemon that I listed above. I also think there would be about two or three more of these prison rigs located in random points in the ocean that you could explore and visit freeing water and earthbending prisoners by performing these breakout minigames a few times. From your return trips in the seas, you would also have random run-ins with pirate vessels who were tasked with capturing you, the Avatar. These pirates would have relatively mild teams, but one particular Pokemon is worth meeting. The evolution to that variant of Chatot that we met earlier. Parahoy, the Buccaneer Pokemon, a dark and flying type. Only the strongest and rudest Chatot who prove their worth are capable of evolving into this large seabird leading their own flocks of Chatot minions across the sea in search of bounties. They rarely engage in petty squabbles, preferring to solve only the most necessary problems with brute force. Their razor-sharp wings can slice through the hulls of ships, and their voice can shatter glass windows if necessary. As you return to the coast and continue through these arduous woods, the greenery suddenly stops, as if someone literally cut through the forest. It's burned, quiet and lifeless, almost like a scar. You're now in what was once the Senlin Forest, a desolate area with a small village nearby. In the outskirts of the village in the Burn Scar of the Forest, you would be able to find wild Murkrow and Ariados perched on trees, and a strange variant of Phantump. Phantump, the grief Pokemon, a ghost and spirit type. These Pokemon were once covered in foliage and lived in harmony in the deepest of forests. After their homes were destroyed as the world changed, they became husks of their former selves. They now roam desolate landscapes, emitting strange cries into the winter night. Paradoxically, touching the wispy body of a phantom is both freezing and burning to the touch, almost as if they commune with another realm somehow. This seems like a good time to introduce the spirit type, a brand new type for this series that I'm sure you're all curious about. Well, very few Pokemon in this world hold this special type. 
but some do regardless, at least two or three in each corner of the world that you're yet to explore. Pokemon with special connections to another realm in some fashion. It's essentially an amalgamation of types that people have wanted from the franchise for some time now. Spirit would be strong against the four primary elements concerned with bending, meaning flying, water, ground, and fire, as this new realm supersedes the power that bending provides. However, spirit Pokemon would be weak to Psychic, Dark, and Dragon, types that rely on higher consciousness or just brute force to do damage to these highly sensitive Pokemon and penetrate the barrier to their otherworldliness. Spirit Pokemon, however, would hold an immunity to normal ghost and steel attacks. Basic items and techniques from the mortal world will do little against these Pokemon. Lastly, spirit Pokemon attacks would conversely be ineffective against these three types and be resisted by itself. Keep all this in mind as you continue to team build, and for any more spirit Pokemon that you're sure to encounter on this journey. Now you can move on if you'd like, but since you're here, we might as well investigate what's going on. The villagers tell you that this place was once one of the lushest in the Earth Kingdom. Home of a noble Pokemon, in fact. But it was burned down by the Fire Nation as they colonized the Western Earth Kingdom, leaving only what you see now, plus a vengeful spirit that's been terrorizing villagers due to this imbalance. Of course, it's the Avatar's job to solve. Plus, there might be a noble Pokemon in it for you. So you head off back into the forest. In the densest part of the woods, the one remaining patch of greenery left here, known as the Lone Bamboo Grotto, you find... A dark, spirit-type noble, Trevenant. This Pokemon is harder to vanquish than the Lycanroc. Not only because it's much bigger, almost the size of a tree, but you sense some other feeling. No, there's an aura emanating off this Pokemon. Something like what you felt from the Southern Air Temple. After a long-fought battle, you finally defeat it, calming the forest spirit and reverting it back to its basic stage, saving the village from terror. But before you can go back, your past life as the Avatar. Before you can say anything, you get a vision. A tower, shrouded by fire. You need to go there. Your next stop is off the coast of Semlin Forest, a tiny outcrop in the sea known as the Crescent Isle. This is technically in the Fire Nation, so you need to be extra careful, but you will get a preview of some Fire Nation signature Pokemon that can be found here in the shores of the island. You can find Slugma, Magmar, Chimchar, and this variant of Salandit on the volcanic shores. Salandit, the Blast Furnace Pokemon, a pure fire type. In the mineral-rich volcanic islands that dot the Fire Nation, Salandit found refuge from predators by carving out subterranean tunnels and caves beneath heat sources. They eat the minerals that they find as they dig, metabolizing precious metals in their hot bellies and spitting it out as a defense mechanism. Salandit droppings are composed of refined iron that humans may use as a fuel source. Eagle-eyed viewers may recognize this as a slight redesign of a Pokemon that I unveiled in a video almost two years ago. So here it is making its return, and later its evolutions. After you've caught all the Pokemon that you want, you make your way up the tower, fighting off various sages and soldiers, even in an encounter with that kid from the Fire Nation, plus an admiral in some sort of boss battle. Together, they would use a Charmeleon, Quilava, Houndoom, Torcat, Phalanx, and Feronin. This seems like the best time to introduce Feronin, the Iron Commander Pokemon, a fire steel type. In the Fire Nation, Salandit has a male-only evolution known as Feronin, they and Salandit minions are platooned by their queens to fight valiantly for their territories. They are adept in both stealth espionage and melee combat, frequently used by human soldiers as mounts for their sharp claws, vicious short-range fire breath, and ability to crawl along any terrain. The furnaces in their bellies produce excess metal, which coats their skin and can regrow quickly if broken off in combat. Unlike female Salandit, Feronin can evolve naturally from male Salandit at level 25 without the use of a held item. After beating all these foes, you need to use your Pokemon to auto the door down where you reach the central shrine, a waypoint to the spirit world, where you meet your old self once again. He warns you of the impending danger. A great Pokemon in the sky, edging closer and closer to the world on its natural cycle through space. The last time it came, about 100 years ago, 
Calamity. But why this Pokemon? What about it caused so much destruction? And does it have anything to do with the glowing nobles, the alphas that you find now? Regardless, this waypoint allows you to take advantage of the spirit world in the state it gives you, the Avatar State, where you can fight off the firebenders using this technique and escape the tower as it burns down. Your mission is even more urgent now. So it's time to get to the North Pole to master waterbending and warn the elders there before that Pokemon finally arrives. To get there, you'll have to cross dangerous Fire Nation occupied sections of the northwestern Earth Kingdom as you complete this area of the map. First up is the Great Divide, a massive canyon that heads northwards with catchable Gligar, Medbray, Fampi, Rufflet, and Vullaby, plus a very powerful Alpha Gliscor that campers here fear and have been calling the Canyon Crawler. The top of the Western Earth Kingdom is a swampy area now completely occupied by the Fire Nation, known as the Ruins of Taku, a former village that's now a marshy, abandoned wasteland, with several Fire Nation strongholds. Here you'll find Wild Skorupi, Krogunk, Ghastly, Gloom, and Sligu. With the option to mount attacks on these strongholds and engage in more Pokemon battles in real-time combat to practice your bending. You can reach the uppermost mountains on the continent, a frigid location known as the Northern Air Temple. This was once home of your people, but it's sadly abandoned, save for a population of Earth Nation refugees led by a scientist. He would give you the option to buy some of his inventions, which includes a more advanced healing item, Pokeball, weapon upgrades, and you could catch wild Drifblim, Swablu, Voltorb, and Dwebble that all make homes in the temples, towers, courtyards, and halls. They would also be a very strong alpha Pokemon that the refugees need help defeating. A 60 foot long Pokemon known as Zephblim. The evolution to Drifblim, the Zeppelin Pokemon, a ghost and flying type. These massive Pokemon are some of the largest known in existence. They are miraculously light enough to float among the clouds unfettered, but their advanced rudder-like tails can propel them downwards or upwards quite nimbly. They are extremely rare and have only been sighted in two of the world's air temples living gently alongside other Pokemon at far away enough distances, but close enough to hear the faint hum of wind churning through their hollow, ghostly bodies. After you've done all you want here, it's time to cross another body of water, as you've officially seen the entire Western Earth Kingdom continent. You head across the frigid Arctic Sea, an ocean where the rocky islands slowly turn to glaciers, and you can catch plenty of Pokemon, including Lapras, Cedra, Alomomola, Dratini, Octillery, Whelmer, and Luminion. After you cross the sea, you finally arrive at... Agna Quela, the capital city of the Northern Water Tribe. This is a bustling hub, a royal city almost completely made out of intricate ice structures. As you make your way through the royal palace, you can encounter Magikarp, Feebas, Cubchoo, Eevee, and Poliwhirl in the canals of the city and in the courtyards of homes. You can explore the city's details, the waterbending and healing academies where you can engage in practice battles against the waterbenders to level up both your Pokemon and master your waterbending fighting. You can also head to tunnels beneath the city known as the Deep Freeze Caverns, an intricate series of caves with a river flowing underneath, where you can catch Frillish, Basculin, Sneasel, Snorunt, Celio, Bergmite, and Haunter. There's even an Alpha Jellicent. Just beyond the city to the north is a vast wasteland, known as the Aurora Sheet. A giant frozen plain that you can brave to catch a rare Vulpix, Amora, Piloswine, or Desclops beneath the blizzard and the northern lights. Here you can also find an incredibly rare Alpha Aurorus. By this point, you should have plenty of ice and water Pokemon for that bending boost that I talked about. But keep in mind, you might want a balanced party for the challenge ahead. As you return to the surface level and meet with the elders, Telling them about the coming conflict. The Fire Nation has found you, and they'll stop at nothing to destroy the city to get to you, the Avatar. You can rush them with your water mending powers and Pokemon, but it'll be no use. There are far too many ships for you to take on alone. No, the Princess of the North offers to take you to the center of the Water Tribe, a special location that could provide the key to victory. To get there, you'll have to fight off the city's invasion. Firebending soldiers are here, and they're shooting fireballs in real time. You'll have to run, jump, and dodge, or fight back using water or airbending. You can even send out your Pokemon to engage with them in real combat. But once you beat them, you rush to... The 
the Spirit Oasis, a pond deep within the central temple of the city. You feel power rushing through here, like that feeling that you got several times entering the spirit world, but stronger, much stronger. The princess explains to you that waterbenders have long been in touch with the world around them. Though they have a guardian Pokemon like your Altaria, the true art of waterbending was learned simply by observing the push and the pull of the tides, the dance between the moon and the ocean, the forces of nature itself. Or so they thought. What they were observing wasn't just nature acting inanimately, but the will of a Pokemon, one with enough presence over the world itself to create a bending style and serve as a pillar of balance. One of four, one for each nation, a divine beast. Waterbenders have since discovered this oasis to be the gateway point to access this beast, though no one really can except for the Avatar. And if there was any time to commune with it, well, now might be the time. If you're ready, you can access this portal and meet this Pokemon in battle. Once you prove yourself through battle, you'll be able to control this Pokemon in the overworld, using it with the most powerful waterbending techniques in the world to stop the siege. It's time. Kyogre, the Leviathan Pokemon, and one of four divine Pokemon of the world, a water and spirit type. This divine beast is the vessel in which the moon and the ocean spirits reside during times of conflict. It is from this gigantic creature that all waterbenders derive their powers, as this Pokemon emanates and distributes oceanic and lunar energy itself. With the mere use of its mind, it can summon tidal waves, large enough to drown ships whole, or clear the skies to reveal the fullest of moons. Generations of waterbenders have prayed to this beast for protection in times of war, though no one has seen it wage its full potential since the days of old. Like the crashing icy tides, this beast is not above vengeance. It will stop at nothing to wield the harshest of defenses against those causing its environment harm. Like its counterparts, when the conflict subsides and its truest foes have been vanquished, it returns to the spirit world, restoring balance to the world, at least for the time being.